please, and turn to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark in chapter 1. We're going to begin reading today in verse 21. Then they went to Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people there were amazed by his teaching because he taught them like one who had authority and not like the experts in the law. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, Leave us alone, Jesus the Nazarene. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Silence, come out of him. After throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He even commands the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So the news about him spread quickly throughout all the region around Galilee. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word and for the opportunity that it gives us to get to know Jesus Christ. And Father, as we study this Gospel of Mark and we look at the themes of Mark and we consider today the Messianic secret, may we understand the, the importance of proper association and the value of action over words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is a theme throughout the Gospel of Mark. Jesus telling people and demons, spirits, not to tell people who he is. And why does he do this? Wouldn't you want this kind of advertisement? Don't you think uh, a demon announcing your identity is, uh, is going to be convincing to other people? Uh, wouldn't uh, someone who's just had their... Uh, their blindness cured or their leprosy cured or their daughter raised up running through the streets shouting about it wouldn't that be great advertising why does Jesus do this a German theologian named Breed who didn't believe that the Bible was divine was trying to explain away this this uh, theme in the Gospel of Mark and he said that the gospel writers uh, this is found throughout the Gospels, but it's a special, especially uh, visible in Mark. The Gospel writers were trying to explain why there wasn't a popular uprising in support of Jesus. Why didn't everyone acclaim him as Messiah? And so Vreed said, well, the, the, the disciples were trying to explain this, or the writer of Mark, he didn't believe that uh, Mark was written by anyone who knew Jesus, uh, he believes it was written later uh, based on legends and stories. And he said the writer of Mark was trying to explain this. And so he said they didn't do it because Jesus told them not to. Well, that's obviously not true, as we're going to see next week in our message on the, the messianic announcement, the messianic revelation. But why did Jesus do this? It can be very confusing. And so we're going to look at a few of these passages, these examples, and we're going to see what it is that Jesus is uh, doing here. Here in Mark chapter 1 verse 24 is the first episode, the first time this happens, and it happens in a synagogue. Jesus has been there. He's been teaching out of the Old Testament. We know that Mark says that he's been going around teaching the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. So he's taken the Old Testament. He's opened it up to these people and he's been teaching out of it. And in that synagogue is a man with an unclean spirit. And nobody else knew it. This unclean spirit was happy to sit there and blend in with everyone else. But when Jesus came in the room, his nature was revealed. His, his presence was revealed. And so he cries out, and he says very interesting thing. Leave us alone, Jesus the Nazarene. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This demon recognized his creator. This demon recognized the authority that was above his. This demon recognized the one who had the power to destroy him and who has a plan to destroy him. The one who will uh, mete out justice to all unclean spirits. And he cries out, is this the time? Is this the end? Are you here to destroy us? But Jesus rebukes him and tells him to be silent and to come out of the man. He did not want the unclean spirit to announce 
his identity. We see this again later on in the chapter in verse 34. So he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, but he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. These demons knew who he was. They knew his power. They knew his authority. They knew his, what, what his presence meant for them. And he told them to be silent, to not speak. He told them to be silent and not to announce his identity. Why did he do that? Let's look at chapter th uh, 3, verse 11. Well, let's start in verse 7. Then Jesus went away with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan River, and around Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude came to them, came to him when they heard about the things he had done. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, so the crowd would not press toward him. For he had healed many, so that all who were afflicted with diseases pressed toward him in order to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. Jesus recognized that the messenger is as important as the message. He realized that that having demons announce his identity would damage his credibility, would, would muddy his message, would lessen his ability to present truth to the people of Israel. And so he told the demons to be silent. Jesus did not want his message associated with demonic power. He was careful of his associations. I'm afraid we're not so careful today of our associations. We're willing to work with or speak with or, or uh, fellowship with or move forward with anyone who has common goals or whom we perceive uh, an affinity. Uh, there are churches that will work with, uh, with cults, with heretics, with unsaved people, with unchristian people altogether in order to achieve or, uh, a goal or in order to get their message spread more broadly. And that's not helpful. Our message becomes tainted by such associations. The message we have is the most important message in all the world, and it is a message that needs to be handled with care and with holiness and with purity. It is the message that all men are sinners, for the wages of sin is death. That is why Jesus preached repentance. There was no one in Israel who did not need to repent. There is no one in the world today who does not need to repent because we are all sinners for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the message continues that the wage, even though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is found by submission to the authority of Christ as Lord and acknowledgement of his person as having risen from the dead by the power of God and presenting new life to us today. Submission and acceptance. And this is a, a powerful message. This is a vital message. This is an important message. And this is a message that demands holiness and purity and good, proper associations. We cannot mix our message with those who deny the deity of Christ, who reject His Lordship, who refuse to live under His authority. These demons were not submitting to Jesus. These demons acknowledged His power but rejected his authority. The first demon said, leave us alone. That is an, a, a rejection of the authority. Even though the message was true, the messenger was false. And therefore, he needed to be quiet. This reminds me of the time when Paul is walking down the street and the demon-possessed girl is behind him saying, listen to these men, they bring us good news. And he turns around and rebu rebukes her and cast the demon out of her. 
Why did he do that? Why didn't he take the free advertising? Because he, everyone in town knew this woman had a demon. And he did not want his message to be associated with demonic activity. And Jesus was the same way. And we know that this was a real danger because we go to the uh, book of Mark chapter 3 and we begin reading in verse 20. Now Jesus went home and a crowd gathered so that they were not able to eat. When his family heard this, they went out to restrain him, for they said, he is out of his mind. The experts in the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. So he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not be able to stand if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan rises against himself and is divided, he is not able to stand and his end has come. But no one is able to enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can thoroughly plunder his house. I tell you the truth. People will be forgiven for all sins, even all blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they said he has an unclean spirit. The leaders of Jerusalem, the leaders of Israel, the experts in the law were trying to explain away his power, his authority, uh, his following, his popularity, and they seized on this association. And they said he can cast out demons because he has the king of demons inside of him. He's possessed by Satan himself. He's possessed by Beelzebul, and therefore he has the authority to cast out other demons. They were trying to explain away his authority. They could not deny the acts. They could not deny the miracles. They could not deny the healing. They could not deny that he cast out demons. And so they were trying to explain it away. And they assigned his authority to demonic authority. And he calls them over to him. And he uses some metaphors here. He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? He says if Satan is fighting against himself, he's weakening himself. He's not united. Satan must have authority over his demons and, his de and he must allow his demons to do their work in order for his work to get done. He said if Satan begins to cast out Satan, then his work is over. He said he did not come in the power of Satan, but he has the power to bind the strong man. He acknowledges Satan as a strong man, and he acknowledges Satan's authority over unsaved people. No one is able to enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up, binds the strong man. He acknowledges the strength of Satan. He acknowledges the authority of Satan over the unsaved world. But he announces his presence as the one who will release the prisoners, who will free the slaves, who will rescue the captives, who will bind the strong man. That is why he came. You see, Jesus didn't come to heal the sick and feed the hungry. Jesus didn't come to cast out demons and put on a show and make a display. Jesus came in order to bind the strong man, to break the power of Satan, to rescue those who are under his authority, to steal what he has and recover it to himself by his death and resurrection. That is his purpose. That is where his authority comes from. Because he has the power to bind the strong man. And then he has a warning for these leaders of Israel. And he tells them about the unpardonable sin. There's a lot of talk about what is the unpardonable sin. What is it that you can do that God will never forgive? We recognize that Christ has died on the cross, an infinite death. Can you imagine? The one who spoke the universe into existence. 
The one who breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. The one who has existed from eternity past. The one who has life in himself. In him was life and that life was the light of man. This infinite life died. This is an infinite death. And what sin, what transgression can be greater than the death and resurrection of our infinite, eternal Lord? Many people worry they've committed the unpardonable sin. Many people struggle with this, that their sin cannot be, be forgiven. But Jesus says in verse 28, I tell you the truth, people will be forgiven for all sins, even all blasphemies they utter. I think of Saul of Tarsus breathing out threatenings and slaughter and murdering the Christians. And the grace of God was able to reach him. So what is the sin that cannot be forgiven? The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When God has revealed the truth to you in all of its fullness, as these men standing here had seen the work of Christ, had heard His teaching from His very mouth, had watched His miracles, had seen His authority, and they knowingly rejected it and chose another explanation. Their hearts are hardened. Their backs are turned. Their sin cannot be forgiven. It is an eternal sin to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit when He reveals the truth to you. That is the unpardonable sin. All other sin can be forgiven. And Jesus did not want the demons to be associated with His message. He wanted people to hear the truth from pure lips. He wanted people to see the truth in, in godliness and to receive it and to recognize who he was for his own person. But what about in chapter 1, verse 44? We'll begin reading in verse 40. Now a leper came to him and fell on his knees asking for help. If you are willing, you can make me clean, he said. Moved with indignation or moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be clean. The leprosy left him at once and he was clean. Immediately, Jesus sent the man away with a very strong warning. He told him, see that you do not say anything to anyone, but go, show yourself to a priest. Bring the offering that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But as the man went out, he began to announce it publicly and spread the story widely so that Jesus was no longer able to enter any town openly, but stayed outside in the remote places. Still, they kept coming to him from everywhere. We see a similar story in Mark chapter 5. Verse 21, when Jesus had crossed again in a boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came up and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and he asked him urgency, my little daughter is, at, is near death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now a woman was there who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she kept saying, if only I touch his clothes, I will be healed. At once the bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she had been healed from her disease. Jesus knew at once that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? 
His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing against you, and you say, Who touched me? But he looked around to see who had done it. Then the woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue leader's house, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? But Jesus, paying no attention to what was said, told the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue leader. When he saw noisy confusion and people weeping and wailing loudly, when he entered, he said to them, Why are you distressed and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they began to make fun of him. But he forced them all outside. And he took the child's father and mother and his own companions and went into the room where the child was. Then gently taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. The girl got up at once and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were completely astonished at this. He strictly ordered that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus lays his hands on a leper, this leper who had lost his place in society, this leper by, the, by, by a contracting this disease of leprosy had been rejected from society. He had been uh, kicked out of his house, thrown out of his city, separated from his family. He would lost his living. He could no longer work and do his job. He could no longer live among people. He could no longer worship God at the temple. He'd lost everything. He was a dead man walking. No one would touch him. No one would go near him. People would throw food at him so that he could eat. He couldn't come near anyone. And yet he comes to Jesus and he says, If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus loved the man. And he showed his love by doing what no one else would do. He touched the man. And as soon as the holy, clean healthy, life-giving Jesus touched this wretched leper. He was clean. Usually it goes the other way. You look at the Old Testament. If a clean person touches an unclean person or an unclean thing, the clean person becomes unclean. But here with Jesus, when Jesus touches an unclean thing or an unclean person, that person becomes clean. This leper was healed. This leper was restored. This leper was, was able to uh, return to his family, return to his work, return to his home, return to society, return to the worship of God. And that's exactly what Jesus told him to do. He warned him, don't go telling people about what I did. This is what I want you to do. I want you to obey the law. Do what Moses said to do. Work out your righteousness. His righteousness did not produce his healing. His righteousness could not cleanse him. The works of the law could not justify him. But having been cleansed, having been healed, having been restored, he had a responsibility to do what was right, to go find a priest, to make the offering, to be declared clean, to be restored to his family, to be re-established in his place in society, and to live a life that reflected the work that Jesus had done in him. But that's not what he did. He ran all over town telling everybody what had happened to him. Now his disobedience didn't remove his cleaning. He didn't catch his leprosy again. But he did not fulfill the work that Christ had set for him to do. He thought by announcing the, the temporal, the temporary, the, the earthbound blessings that God had given to him, he was doing the work of God, but actually he was hindering the work of God because he was distracting from the message. 
We see this with Jairus' daughter. Now it's fascinating to me. There's two healings in this passage. There's the woman and the synagogue leader. The woman with an issue of blood. And she also, by reason of the issue of blood, was unclean. She could not enter into the temple. She could not go to the synagogue. She could not be with her husband. She was unclean. And it didn't get better. But by touching Jesus, rather than making him unclean, he made her whole. And she come, he, he calls out, who touched me? And she comes with fear and trembling, knowing how wrong it was of her to touch him. According to the world's eyes. But he welcomes her. He receives her. He confirms her healing. He tells her that it is her faith that has worked this change in her. And he doesn't tell her not to tell anybody. He doesn't tell her to be quiet about it, to keep it to herself. But then he goes on to Jairus' house, and Jairus' daughter has died. And he tells everybody, she's not dead, she's just sleeping, and they all make fun of him. And he takes a few of his disciples, he takes Peter, James, and John, and I always wondered, what did the other nine do? Well, they were doing crowd control. They were keeping everybody back. He left them to control the crowd that was gathered around him so that he could go into the house and have the peace to do what he was going to do. He goes into the house. He takes this child by the hand, and he says, Child, get up. And being an obedient 12-year-old girl, she hopped out of bed. And they were completely astonished at this. One minute she's deaf, the master touches her, and she's alive. One minute she's laying sick, and the next minute she's up and healthy. One minute she's wasted away, and the next moment she's hungry and ready to get on with her life. In verse 43, he strictly ordered that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. What do you think their first reaction was? To run out into the street to this crowd and shout, My daughter is healed! My daughter is healed! He raised her from the dead! But the poor girl's hungry. She's been sick for who knows how long. She's wasted away. She's hungry. She needs to eat. And instead of going out and making a big production and an announcement, they needed to just sit down and serve this girl. Take care of their own. Feed their family. So many people got caught up in the big, flashy, visible, amazing miracles. That's what they wanted to talk about. That's what they wanted to see. That's what they wanted to have. That's what they wanted Jesus to do. They didn't care about his message. They didn't care about his words. They weren't interested in repentance. They just wanted healing. If the leper had been healed without having faith in Jesus Christ, what good would it have done him? Let's say he lived another 70 years with his family and his friends, in his house, in his society, and he worked his job, and he went to synagogue, and he died and went to hell for eternity. Was it worth it? The healing is wonderful, but it's temporary. Everybody's going to die. That's the wages of sin. To take the sting out of death and the victory from the grave requires a resurrection. And that can only be accomplished by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is their faith that saved them. It is their faith that healed them. We go to the story in, chap in Mark chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. Now after some days, 
When he returned to Capernaum, the news spread that he was home. So many gathered there that there was no longer any room, not even by the door. And he preached the word to them. Some people came bringing him to him a paralytic carried by four of them. When they were not able to bring him in because of the crowd, they removed the roof above Jesus. Then after tearing it out, they lowered the stretcher the paralytic was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the experts in the law were sitting there, turning these things over in their minds. Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now immediately when Jesus realized in his spirit that they were contemplating such thoughts, he said to them, why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your stretcher, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, stand up. Take your stretcher and go home. And immediately the man stood up, took his stretcher, and went out in front of them all. They were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. He's in the house. He's teaching. The house is crowded. And he's preaching the Word. It is the Word that they need. It is the Word that He has brought. It is the Word that He proclaims. It is the Word that He wants to sink into their hearts. It is the seed. It is the, the Word is the seed that needs to settle in the soil of our hearts. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But they're not hearing the Word. Because... When this paralytic man is lowered down, Jesus immediately deals with his most pressing problem, which is not his paralysis. It is his sin. And he forgives this man's sin. We don't hear the paralytic complaining. Anyone who has experienced the forgiveness of sin realizes the value of that freedom, the, the joy of the new life. The forgiveness of sins is a removal of a burden. It is a canceling of a condemnation. It is a restoration of our standing in the sight of God. It is justification before God Almighty. What could be greater than that? But the people standing around him said, what's he think he's doing? Who does he think he is to forgive someone's sin? So he turns to them and said, why are you thinking about these things? What's the easier thing to do? Forgive sins or healing? Well, obviously, healing is easier. Obviously, healing is the easier act. It's the temporary act. It's just, it's just working on this body that he formed out of the dust of the ground. He knows our frame. But to forgive our sins took the death of Christ himself on the cross, the shedding of his blood, the application of his righteousness to my account that he became sin for us. He was our propitiation. In order to demonstrate his authority to forgive sins, he heals the body. I tell you, stand up. Take your stretcher and go home. Immediately the man stood up, took his stretcher, and went out in front of them all. They all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I wonder how many of these people were in the crowd shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! How many of the ones when he stood in the temple healing all who came to him just a few days before were in that crowd shouting, we have no king but Caesar. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Signs are wonderful. And I'm, thank I'm thankful that Christ performed them. Miracles 
are uh, a wonderful confirmation of his identity, but they are not the sign we looked for. They are not the reason Jesus came. He didn't come to change our bodies. He came to change our hearts. He didn't come to heal our sickness. He came to forgive our sin. He didn't come to give us a healthier, happier, wealthier life. He came to give us an eternal life. And that's why he tells them in chapter 8. Now, remember, here in chapter 8, well, two, two chapters over in chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 men. Maybe ten to 15,000 people altogether. Five loaves and two fish. In chapter 8, he feeds 4,000 with seven loaves and a few fish. He's, in, in chapter 7, he's healed the deaf mute. In chapter 6, He's walked on water. He's healed the sick. In chapter 5, we saw uh, that he healed Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood. He's healed. He's helped. He's cleansed. He's raised the dead. He's cast out demons. And so what do they ask him for in verse 11 of chapter 8? Then the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, asking for a sign from heaven to test him. They said, you say all these things, you say all these words, you preach the word to us, but back it up. Show us a sign. What's he been doing? How many signs do they need? This is the thing. A miracle is never enough. Signs are never enough to change a heart, to, to convict a mind, to turn man in repentance from their own way to God's way. That takes faith. And faith comes by hearing. Verse 12, sighing deeply in his spirit. He says, why does this generation look for a sign? I tell you the truth. No sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, going back into the boat and went to the other side. Now in the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus expands on this a little bit, and he says, no sign will be given to this generation, but the sign of Noah. As Noah was three days in the belly of the uh, whale, so the Son of Man will be three days in the heart of the earth. The sign that Jesus offers is the sign of his resurrection. It is the resurrection that seals our faith. It is the resurrection that proves our life. It is the resurrection that settles our justification. It is the resurrection that provides for our sanctification. It is the resurrection in, we find, in which we find hope for our new life, for our new bodies, for our eternal state with Him. It is the resurrection that is the sign that they rejected. What happened when He rose from the dead? They lied about it and told everybody his, bo his body had been stolen. Even the sign of Jonah was not enough for those who would not hear the word. We don't look for a sign. Jesus didn't want people running around announcing his miracles because he didn't want people looking for the wrong things. Jesus wants you to hear his word. He wants you to allow that word to take root in your heart, produce faith in your life, and transform you into a submissive, receptive servant. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We need to be careful who we associate our message with. We don't just lock arms and link hands with just anybody. Now, we can cooperate on certain things, but we need to be careful who we associate the Word of God, our message, the Gospel with. We don't want the message to be sullied by the messenger. And we need to be more interested in doing than saying. 
rather than running around talking about the miracles that God has done. And we rejoice in the goodness of God and we report to one another the way he works in our lives and we share our praise reports and we rejoice in this. But it is not miracles we seek, it is the the uh, heart of Christ. It is the word of God. It is the message of the gospel. It is the redemption of our souls and the resurrection of our body to eternal life. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've never acknowledged him as Lord, confessed with him that he is Lord and you are not, that you're not in charge of your own life, that he has authority over you and you accept that authority, you receive his lordship, you surrender your heart to him. If you've never done that, I'd urge you to do so today. Don't look for a sign. Listen to the word. For those of us who have been changed, transformed, renewed into his likeness, let us do the work. Let us live righteously and love those around us. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus Christ. We are grateful that he came. We're grateful for all the miracles he did. We praise you, Lord, for the demonstration of his power. But Lord, we rejoice most of all in the sign of Jonah, the resurrection of, the, of Jesus Christ from the tomb on that third day. And Father, we pray that you will empower us to preach the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.